Have you been told you have IBS, but your symptoms never seem to go away? Maybe you've tried the low FODMAP diet, probiotics, medications, nothing sticks. The real reason could be something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Basically, it means you've got bacteria growing in the wrong place, the small intestine, in quantities that they shouldn't be in, which can be the root cause of many gut symptoms. And this might not be as rare as first thought. Research shows about one in three people with gut complaints actually test positive for SIBO. And depending on the study, up to 78% of IBS patients may have SIBO as the root cause of their symptoms. So if you've been dismissed with it's just IBS or gut issues are just part of getting older, in many cases, it's actually SIBO. But here's what most doctors miss. SIBO is not just one thing. So depending on the gas that's being produced, hydrogen, methane, or hydrogen sulfide, the symptoms and the treatments can look very different. So in this video, I'll break it all down in simple terms, backed by real research and real patient experience. My name is Joe Leach. I'm a qualified dietitian and I run one of the world's largest online gut health clinics. We've helped tens of thousands of clients successfully treat their gut issues, especially SIBO and its subtypes. And knowing which one you have is important because it changes how you treat it, which I'll explain now. So the first subtype of SIBO I'll go over is hydrogen dominant SIBO. It's often linked with IBSD, the diarrhea type of IBS. So what happens here is these bacteria ferment your food quickly, creating gas and speeding up the transit time. This causes chronic loose stools and diarrhea. Now the way this type of SIBO is detected, in fact, the way all of them are detected is through a breath test. I have a video with some of my team members going over that process and how tests are interpreted. If you are interested, I can link that in the description of this one and you can watch it after. Essentially on a breath test, you'll see hydrogen levels rise 20 parts per million or more within 90 minutes while methane stays below 10 parts per million. Now in terms of treatment options, first line is typically a well-studied antibiotic called rifaximin, which is prescription only and it works well because it stays in the gut and knocks down the bacterial load. Research indicates the recommended dose is 1650 milligrams per day split into three doses for 14 days and it has a 70% success rate for hydrogen SIBO specifically. An alternative to the pharmaceutical approach is herbal therapy. So these herbal antimicrobials they help reduce bacterial load and have demonstrated symptom improvements comparable to antibiotics in some studies. There are many different protocols used, but essentially the staples are berberin, at least 400 milligrams twice daily, plus oregano oil, at least 150 milligrams per day. And then also potentially additional compounds like allicin, neem, and more. Of course, don't actually do any of this yourself without seeking direct guidance from a health professional first. The protocols can be between two to eight weeks, in many instances more affordable than rifaximin, but it just takes a lot longer. Now in terms of diet, strict low FODMAP is recommended after the antibiotic or antimicrobial process and then a structured reintroduction phase after that. I'm not going to dive into detail about FODMAPs in this video as I have many videos on the channel covering this topic, but essentially it's a proven diet protocol that removes the most fermentable carbs from your diet, the, the fuel for the bad bacteria, if you will. And then the diet reintroduces those foods later step-by-step step to minimize symptoms and help determine, at least in the case of hydrogen dominant SIBO, what foods were accelerating intestinal transit in the first place. So you understand your triggers. Now there is actually an exciting breakthrough diet protocol that is getting results like we've never seen before. It was recently presented um, at the American College of Gastroenterology annual meeting and Digestive Disease Week. And I will talk about it in the next section on, on methane dominant SIBO. So make sure you stick around for that. Now, before we move on, if you're looking for guidance with this, we've built a comprehensive one-to-one -one program that walks you through every step from testing to treatment to long-term prevention. So you don't have to figure it out alone. It's a unique process we call the For Sure Pathway. And SURE is an acronym. S is for symptom relief, U is for understanding your root cause, R is for rebuilding a healthy gut, and E is for eating with freedom once more. So just comment sure pathway below or click the first link in the description and we can send you all the details about that. And if you'd like a written guide for managing SIBO, including what to eat, we've also put together 
a free a written SIBO guide. You can comment SIBO guide to get that. You can tap the second link in the description below this video. The second subtype of SIBO is methane dominant SIBO, now called intestinal methanogen overgrowth or IMO. So what happens here is you have microbes in the digestive tract that are producing excessive methane gas, which acts like a neurotransmitter in your gut because methane literally slows down gut motility and everything gets backed up. That's why people with methane SIBO, this overgrowth of methanogens, they get constipation or IBSC, and hard stools and bloating, and that feeling of incomplete evacuation. On testing to confirm this, you'll see uh, methane levels of 10 parts per million or higher at any time point, often elevated even in the baseline fasting sample. Now in terms of first line treatment, methanogens are really tough to eradicate. Studies show that rifaximin alone is usually not enough. So the standard is a combo of rifaximin plus another antibiotic that targets methanogens. Clinical guidelines recommend rifaximin, 1650 milligrams per day, plus neomycin, 1000 milligrams a day, for 14 days, which has shown success in reducing methane levels and improving constipation. There are some alternative combination therapies that you may try with the doctor depending on how you respond. Just know that multiple courses of therapy are not uncommon for this type of SIBO, given that uh, methane producers can be really stubborn. Now, as for herbal therapy alternatives, these are actually frequently used for methane SIBO, either alone or alongside the antibiotics. So notably allicin, which I mentioned earlier, that's an extract of garlic. Um, that's a favored herb for methane due to its targeted effect on methanogens. Practitioners will often combine allicin with other botanicals, berberin, um, oregano, neem, etc. So a protocol might use Allison for 450 milligrams three times daily, plus berberin 500 milligrams three times daily, for example. Again, I'm just stating doses that have been studied, but you need to speak to your health professional before you do anything. Keep in mind that while herbs can work, they require longer treatment duration, usually six plus weeks, and a lot of patients actually alternate herbal therapy and antibiotic courses to minimize resistance or side effects. Now, as for diet, this is the most exciting part. First, I'll say that low FODMAP is still indicated here because methanogens thrive on fermenting fibers. So high fiber foods like beans, oats, cruciferous vegetables, etc., they can lead to more methane and bloating. So yes, low FODMAP and low fiber are beneficial until symptoms are back under control, at which point you would start exploring with different types of fibers. The key really is to identify triggers and eat a balanced diet that doesn't excessively feed the methane producers. But the most exciting part though, that I was talking about before, is the new 14-day elemental diet protocol, which I won't be surprised if it becomes a first-line treatment for SIBO, especially hydrogen and methane dominant in the future. Now currently I rate it as like a fallback if other treatments don't or can't work because it's expensive and a bit unpleasant to eat, to be real, because an elemental diet is a liquid diet of pre-digested nutrients that requires no digestion by the body. And so that's all you consume for two weeks straight. Here's the thing, a recent peer-reviewed study presented at you know, the major digestive conferences that I mentioned before, they found that 73% of SIBO patients objectively normalize their breath tests within 14 days following this elemental diet protocol. So just about three out of four patients had normal breath test readings after just two weeks, no antibiotics or anything else even those with the stubborn methane dominant SIBO. That is unprecedented. I mean, you're saving months of antibiotic use there. And patient compliance was 100%. That's never before been achieved with an elemental diet because it's so restrictive. And it indicates that this particular formula perhaps doesn't taste as awful as its predecessors because everyone completed the 14 days. But yeah, it's really exciting for the gut health space. Perhaps I'll do a video or like on this topic specifically another time, so make sure you subscribe to the channel. The third and final SIBO subtype is hydrogen sulfide dominant SIBO. So this subtype was only more recently recognized because the standard breath tests just couldn't measure it. The patients would get a normal uh, flat line of results. So little hydrogen or methane rise in the chart despite having clear symptoms. So what's happening here is that excess bacteria are feeding on sulfur and producing hydrogen sulfide gas. Now that's the gas that gives stools and flatulence, that classic rotten egg smell. So to give you a picture, when I was a child visiting Rotorua in New Zealand, that place had that 
same sulfur smell from volcanic activity. I'll never forget it to this day. It's the exact same gas, hydrogen sulfide, whether it's coming from a volcano or from a bacteria in your gut. And we had a client that described their experience as, I had constant diarrhea, intense, rotten egg smelling gas and bowel movements, major bloating after eating high format foods. I wasn't formally diagnosed, but the symptoms were unmistakable. Unfortunately, now we have access to newer breath tests on the market that can detect hydrogen sulfide SIBO, which is important because the treatment differs from the other SIBO types. Okay, so rifaximin can still help, but often we add bismuth, which is the active ingredient found in some over-the-counter stomach medicines like Pepto-Bismol in the US. It binds hydrogen sulfide gas and reduces those sulfur producing bacteria. This bismuth solution has been known for decades. And in this study, taking 524 milligrams four times daily reduced hydrogen sulfide production by up to 95%. What's interesting is a 2023 clinical registry of 131 hydrogen sulfide cases found the most effective treatments were the bismuth compounds, 39.7% success, oregano oil, 44%, and low sulfur diets, 46.6% success. So diet changes are arguably the most important in this SIBO subtype because it's a delicate balance to ensure proper nutrition while not feeding the bacteria too many FODMAPs, which they will ferment and cause symptoms, but also not consume too many sulfur-containing foods either. So that means avoiding foods like eggs, garlic, onions, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, that's cauliflower, cabbage. And then herbs like oregano and berberine are sometimes added to the diet treatment protocol, just as with other SIBO subtypes. Now diet and eating patterns in general are very individualized, especially when we're talking about meeting your own nutrition requirements for a particular person. So essentially, you want to meet those requirements, but minimize the sulfur-containing foods and minimize the FODMAP. That's the goal. SIBO recurrence is common. Now here's the hard truth. About 45% of people relapse within a year in SIBO returns. That's because if you don't fix the underlying issue, things like motility, diet, gut function, the bacteria just come back. It's like a mold in a house, right? You can scrub it off the walls, but if the damp leak behind the wall isn't fixed, the mold will always return. So if you suspect SIBO, the steps you need to take are step one, Get the right breath test to identify your specific SIBO type. Step two is choose the most appropriate treatment approach. And step three is to address the underlying causes and triggers. Step four will be plan for maintenance and avoid recurrence. So if you want help navigating this process from getting the right testing to implementing the appropriate treatment protocol for your specific SIBO type, we have a comprehensive one-to-one -one program that guides you through every step to make this process as smooth, quick and stress-free for you as possible. And we do everything online. The testing is sent to your house. We do all our sessions on Zoom. You can do everything from the comfort and convenience of your own home. Tap the first link in the description to see my training video on how it all works and to speak with us directly. Or alternatively, you can comment Sure Pathway and we can send you the details. And if you'd like our free SIBO guide with all these details and more about the diet components as well, Comment SIBO guide and we can send it to you or tap link number two in the description. SIBO can be challenging, but it's treatable when you have the right approach. The key is precision. Okay, so you've got to treat your specific type with the appropriate protocol. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe and yeah, you know what to do. And if you want to learn more about SIBO testing and our process there, you can watch this next video.